gotta do better than that. So we're going like this. We're gonna have a long day. Let's lift up our eyes towards heaven right now. To the author and the finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's commend this day into his hands. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, my God, we come to you this morning, my God, with open arms, my God, with open hearts, my God, with open minds, my God. We come to you, my God, just as we are, my God, in our weakness, my God, in our brokenness, my God, in whatever state that we find ourselves, my God, and we just ask you, oh Lord, that once again, we can't go up to you. For you are too high, you are too lofty, you are too exalted, you are too glorious, my God. In our flesh, in our carnality, in our fallen state, oh God, we can't, oh God, go up to you. We can't go past into the dirt heavens. We can't enter in, oh Lord, into your courts, my God, my God, in this earthly suit, in this earthly, my God, garments, my God. And so we ask you in this morning, my God, by your grace and by your mercies, my God, by your divine favor and love, of great love that you have toward each and every one of us. My God, that you would come down to us. My God, come down, oh Lord, to us. My God, bow down, my God, and descend, my God, into this place. My God, as you have, oh Lord, since the day that you saved us. As you have, oh God, since the day that you regenerate us. Regenerate us as you have, oh God, since the day that you made us born again, alive in the spirit, oh God. My God, descend, my God, this morning into this place with a shout. My God, a shout of a conqueror. The shout of a victor. The shout, my God. My God, of a returning general. Of a returning king, my God. As if it were straight from the battlefield. A conqueror. A victor over the enemy. My God, and we ask you, oh God, that as we praise you, as we worship you, as we magnify you, as we glorify you in this place, that we may sound as one man that we may sound like one body, that we may sound, my God, as one with one mind and one spirit, oh God, praising your glory, worshiping your presence, worshiping, my God, hallelujah, the name that's above every other name, the name of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns forevermore. My God, you reign in this place, and we ask you, Lord, Abide in the midst of the praises of this people, my God, who gather today. Abide in the midst, my God, of a people, my God, who came to seek you, who came, my God, to be with you, who came to minister, my God, at your feet, who came to offer up sacrifices of joy, sacrifices of shouting, sacrifices of thanksgiving, praise and worship, my God, in the day of today my God and we just ask you oh Lord that as we come together to sit at your feet this morning my God in this men's conference all we ask you oh God is that you would transform our very lives daily continually oh pray with me this morning say Lord transform me I don't hear nobody praying. Say, Lord, here I am. A vessel. A lump of clay. Pray with me this morning. Here I am, Lord. A lump of clay. Mold me. Shape me. Transform me. Conform me into the perfect man who is my Lord, my Savior, my soon coming King, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord of my life. I want to be more like Him. I want to be more like my Savior. I want to be more like my God. 
and now state your name and I want to be less like Hubie. I want to be less like Hubie. I want to be less like Paul. I want to be less like Patrick. I want to be less like Ezekiel. I want to be less like Coonley. And I want to be more like Jesus. Have your way in my life and have your way in this place. And we declare today's session of Resilient Man Conference open for business. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that said, I just want to um, let us stand up. I mean, the man needs no introduction. All right. I mean, so just give him a round word of applause. I mean, welcome the bishop. God bless. Thank you. Praise the Lord. How are you this morning? Everybody doing well? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm waiting on my, uh, uh, Brother Toby, if you can bring me one of those notes while I wait for my laptop to come down. I honor you for, again, taking time out to be in this conference. I appreciate you for, uh, for your support and the way you support your pastor. So we're going to talk this morning. I know a lot more things will be done today. And uh, this morning, we're going to talk about one very important thing that happens um, to men and that we have to think about and consider if we're going to stay spiritually resilient. And that is the fact that we have to maintain sexual purity, maintain sexual purity. So let's pray. Let's talk to God. I'd like you to lift your voice and ask God to speak to you. Ask him to let the word of God do you good this morning. Ask him that the spirit of revelation would be in this place. That there would be weight on his word. This morning I'm believing not just for information but for impartation. For deep impartation. Father, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you for what you're doing among these men. We thank you for how you're fortifying us and strengthening us. We thank you, Father, that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. We thank you, Lord, that you're fortifying an army in this hour, an army of men who would rise up and glorify your name in the earth. And there's nothing that the enemy could do about it. We believe that this morning will be part of that process in fortifying us and making us who we need to be in you. So we honor you and we thank you and we give you praise. Holy Spirit, over to you. Impart to us, strengthen us and grace us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, that verse is in your notes. It's at the top. I want us to read that verse together, loud with vibrato. And by the way, I honor the praise and worship team this morning for taking us before the throne of God. That was some good stuff, man. That was incredible. I love praising God when it's tenor and bass, not just soprano and alto. Something about that male sound crying out to God that makes the angels do backflips. And I honor you guys. And a lot of times you go to men's conference and the men's praise team you know, they up there, they praise, and the thing is, they just, they just don't sound good. This one sounded good, and it had the anointing on it. <clears throat> so I, I appreciate that. So let's read Ephesians 5, 3 together. Ready? Read. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. Let's read it again. Ready? Read. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality are any kind of impurity. One more time. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. That's a deep verse, is it not? God is saying among you, there should not be a hint, not even a rumor, not even a little bit of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. That's the standard the Bible puts up for us. Now, warring for sexual purity is a battle 
that is not foreign to most men. In fact, if you were to draw a bell curve, the first 10% of men would be men who have no issues with sexual temptation of the eyes or the minds. So get it, if you draw a bell curve, bell curve starts here, goes up like this, comes around, and then it's over in the bottom. The first 10% will be men who have no issues with sexual temptation in the eyes or the mind. At the other end of the curve would be another 10% of men who are sexual addicts. The men, these men have serious problems with lust and the behavior that comes from it. Men at this stage have often been so beaten and so scarred emotionally, they need help overcoming the, the sin in their lives. Most of the people are in that 80% of the middle that are living in various degrees of trouble with sexual sin. Various degrees of trouble. Some, maybe a little bit, temptation, they're overcoming it, they're doing well. Some, maybe they're not doing so well. So it's an issue that in a men's conference we have to deal with. And this deals with relational resilience. It deals with uh, purity of our heart and resilience. It deals with us being spiritually resilient. So no matter where we find ourselves in the bell curve, we must honestly embrace scripture and the scriptural standard for sexual purity. The word of God says there should not even be a hint, a bit of sexual immorality among us. And I'm a firm believer that God would never command us to do what's impossible. Give me an amen right there. He wouldn't command us if it wasn't possible. Let's look, therefore, at the priority God places on sexual purity in almost every book of the New Testament that has something to say about it. So it doesn't really matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't really matter what other preachers say. Um, I've watched YouTube videos recently where there are prominent, popular preachers, one of them, was saying, I don't care what you say, but the Bible nowhere says that sex before marriage is sin. I saw him say that with my own mouth. He's lying. I heard another pastor, very prominent pastor in Atlanta, who uh, said that it's true that the Bible says there's no sex before marriage, but for those ladies who are getting in your 30s or 40s and you're not married yet, for you, we need another gospel. That's what he said, because... Your body's getting to a place where you need to fulfill some needs that you have. The guy probably has 10,000 people in his church, very prominent pastor, very prominent leader. I don't care what they say. I don't care what anybody else says. I, uh, a young man was growing up in my church once, and he went to another church to preach, and the pastor pulled him into the office. He was young. He was struggling a bit. So he went to talk to the pastor, and he said... I'm struggling, I, I like ladies, there's some things that you know, I wanna do, but I know it's wrong, and the preacher said, no, 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 son. He said, it's okay. He said, just don't have more than one lady at a time, okay? I don't care what he says. Let's look at what the Word of God says. Can we do that? No, we can't do that? Can we do that? Let's do that. Matthew chapter five, verse 28, let's read it together. Ready, shall we read? But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we know about that standard. Uh, the thing that's, that's really interesting about this verse is it's true. <laughs> There's no, no way we can erase it. No way you can look away from it. Now, uh, just so that we can be clear, lust is not noticing beauty. We talked about that a little bit last night. Lust is not noticing. Lust is feasting on, imagining, desiring, coveting, craving. In the uh, Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor. So when you look at something and you covet it, you desire it, you mentally imagine yourself, you disrobe it in your mind, you, that's lust. Noticing is not lust. Even appreciating is not lust. Even gratitude for, again, I, I can't, I looked at it again when we pulled in. Brother Toby picked me up from the hotel. We got here, we pulled in, and the first car I saw was a beautiful gray Tesla Model S. I keep sending hints to your pastor. I don't know if he's getting them or not. <laughs> Uh, and it's just, it just beautiful just sitting there looking at me, you know? And uh, yeah, so you notice those kind of things, but it's wrong for me to covet. It's okay for me to pray that he will give me, but it's wrong for me to covet. <laughs> no. So I'm just trying to, I, I don't want you walking in bondage because noticing is not sin. Coveting is sin. So the Bible says whenever you look upon a woman lustfully, 
Not noticing, not all the things, you know, because if, if, if there's something that uh, moves you one way or another, you see that, whatever. But no, no, it's, it's not the first look. It's the second look and the third look and the thoughts and the imaginations that come after that. That is spiritual adultery, the word of God says. All right, Acts 15, 2 through 9. Let's read that together. Ready? Read. And you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You do well to avoid these things. So when the early church uh, was dealing with people who was trying to put them in bondage to keep the, the entire Mosaic law, the 400, and I think it's 469 or 470 commands that w- they were given in the Mosaic law, when they were put under that bondage, the apostles came together to consider the matter, and they came up with a few things. If you would keep yourself from idols and from blood and from the meat of strangled animals and sexual immorality, he said to the early church, you will do well. So the message to the early church is don't give yourself to idolatry, don't sacrifice animals, and don't commit sexual immorality. If you do these things, then you shall do well. That's how important this was in the early church and now. 1 Corinthians 15, 11. All right, ready? Let's read. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or slanderer or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. So now the word of God is talking about influence. So if all the guys you run with are running in a way that is immoral, it won't be long before immorality begins to knock on your door. If you really think about it, if I stood up on this stage and you stood down here on the floor, will it be easier for me to pull you up on the stage or easier for you to pull me down? Easier for you to pull me down. Evil communication corrupts good manners. So God's saying, if you're dealing with brethren who are sexually immoral, stop it. Don't even go to Shoney's with them. Don't take them out to eat. Cut off the fellowship. That's how important sexual purity is in the word of God. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. That's a very holy verse. The body is made for the Lord. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not made for sexual impurity. So God has dignified the human body with a certain degree of honor, a certain degree of holiness, a certain degree of respect. And we have to understand that, though, even though these are our bodies in a sense, we have stewardship over them. They are the temple of the living God and the body is for the Lord. First Corinthians six eighteen. Ready? Let's read. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. So the Bible gives us a very, very uh, practical strategy for how to overcome sexual immorality. That strategy is listed in that verse. I'm going to see who can pick it out. And once you pick it out, holler at me. What? Flee. What's another word for flee? Run, brother. Anybody can think of anybody in the Bible who ran? Joseph. Do you think Potiphar's wife was ugly? No. Day after day, the Bible said she cast her eyes on him. Come and lie with me. But he had too much integrity in his heart to do that. He realized that that 15-minute ordeal would plunge his life into devastation. And he literally left a coat in her hands and ran. I was preaching on this one time, and somebody said, said um, and the way I would preach it, I was saying, listen, brothers, when we get into temptation, the wrong thing to do is stand there and think because you're a great man of God, you can overcome. The Bible says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? You know, so again, it's fire. So understand something about sexual temptation. God made it to be in the confines of marriage. That's why there's no, or, I don't want to say there's no, but it's very hard to put the gears in reverse when you start shifting up. When you start getting into a sexual uh, frenzy and desire, because it's made for marriage relationship, the reverse gear is hard to find. It's not hard to shift from first into second, second into third, third into fourth, mm. fourth into fifth. Can I get a witness? <laughs> but, but if you're in, so some people think they can play with it and get as close as you can get 
all the way to the door and then put it in reverse. Would you tell your brother that's hard, man? It's hard. So the best thing to do is not even put your hand on the gear shift to begin with. The best, I'm serious about this. The best way to avoid sexual immorality is to stay far away from it. You heard me tell you the story about when I was single, courtship with my wife, and I never went in my apartment with her alone. I prayed six hours a day in Atlanta. I studied the word two hours a day. I was a man who was believing in holiness, preaching holiness, living in holiness, but I understood that if I take my wife to my apartment to look at the drapes and the bedspread and everything else that, uh, you know. <laughs> so I stayed away. Now, you might say that's extreme, but I say, brother, Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, what do you do? Cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. In fact, the Bible calls us to give aggressive approaches to being clean. So if we stay away from uh, that which could lead us into temptation, that's one of the best ways to stay clean. So the Bible says, flee sexual immorality. Stay away from it. Run from it. So you say, well, how do you do that? If you're going to get married and you're single, you have to go out and you date somebody. Yes. So date in groups. Date in groups. Go to public places. You know, avoid the kind of situations where you go on a date, go sit in a restaurant and eat, then you finish, then you park the car in front of the lake so you can read the book of Revelation together. <laughs> and you put on some nice music on the radio and the lights are coming into the car and you open up the book of Revelation. Uh, we all know where that's going. No, serious. We have to have aggressive approaches to cleanness. Can I get an amen this morning? Colossians 3, 5 through 6. Let's read it. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So the Bible says put it to death. It wants to live. It wants to be alive. But we, through the Spirit, can actually put it to death. Now, sexual immorality includes definitions of adultery, that's those that are married that commit sexual sin, fornication, those that are single that commit sexual sin, and uncleanness. Uncleanness has a variety of, of meanings, um, homosexualities in that. Uh, I, I believe even things we do with ourselves are in that. Adultery is an act of a married person having sexual intercourse with someone who is not their spouse. Fornication, the most common definitions of fornication is sex before marriage, but it also includes any unlawful sex act like pornography, bestiality, homosexuality, pedophilia, prostitution, orgies, wife swapping, masturbation, so forth and so on. Uncleanness is whatever defiles. It can be things like an impure gesture or look, uh, dressing in inappropriate ways, impure thoughts, flirting, Dirty jokes, that fits into the category of uncleanness. Now, this message is not designed, by the way, to put anybody in bondage. I want you to listen to me. If God be for you, who can be against you? It calls us to walk in greater spiritual resilience, to cause us to walk in an area that the enemy has used to conquer many men. In fact, the word says in Proverbs, many strong men have been slain by her. Many strong men have been slain by her. Uh, some of the greatest attacks against men are the three G's. Anybody know what the three G's are? Gold, girls, and glory. Are money, women, and pride. The three areas that the enemy seeks to attack through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is money, women, and pride. Gold, girls, and glories. And these are three areas that we have to begin to overcome. So some people, maybe they do okay in the area of temptation and their heart is settled and, you know, sexual temptation is not a big issue. Then they may have to watch for pride because pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. When, when pride comes in, destruction is lurking around there. And then others, it's greed that gets a hold of their heart. They begin to get greed in their heart. So we have to guard ourselves against all of these. And today we're primarily talking about the area that the enemy has used to attack, to steal, kill, and destroy a lot of men. 
So sexual sin must be dealt with at a personal and emotional level. Let's take a look at what makes sexual temptation so tempting. The bottom line of sexual temptation is simply pleasure. Highs from sexually charged images. Men experience a chemical reaction that causes him to feel emotionally high. A hormone called epinephrine is released into the bloodstream whenever this chemical is released. Our brain locks into its memory the stimulus that created the emotional high. So whenever you see an image or experience uh, sex or something, there's a chemical that's released, epinephrine. Um, there's also this other chemical that's released when a person is having a sexual uh, intercourse. I think it's oxytocin. I can't remember if that's the right name or not, but it's like the, it, they call it the intimacy chemical because God made sex to be in marriage. So if a person's having sex, that chemical oxytocin is released and it's the only time it's released on a sexual encounter and it has a very unique stimulus that draws you back to that person again because God wanted to deepen the sexual bond in marriage. And God wanted to be where you have sex with your wife, that chemicals release, so that sex alone brings you closer together, brings you in greater intimacy. The problem is when you're doing that with other people that you're not in covenant with, other people that you're not married to, people that you don't even know, prostitution or whatever the case might be, there's still epinephrine that's released, that oxytocin is still released, and it causes a very high emotional hormonal release in the body that draws you back again and again because a person wants that. So in some ways, it's a chemical release in our brain that locks into our memory the stimulus that created the emotional high. There's also a, psycho a physiological aspect to sexual pleasure. When male sexual response is blocked, the two seminal vessels, the small bags that contain semen, gradually fill up, that word should be fill, gradually fill up. And once they are full and hormones are released, it, calls, it causes the man to be more sensitive to sexual stimuli. So here's what happens with men. Men literally have a physiological response where we have a bag. And every two to three to four days, the bag fills up with seed. All right? Once it gets full, something triggers in your body and in your mind, and it actually awakens you to sexual reality in a way that you were not awakened before. Now, so single men who don't have a chance to uh, actually get a release, then, you know, there are other ways that body takes care of that and so forth and so on. But understand that there's literally a trigger in your body physiologically when you're full, when your, your sacs are full, and you're more sensitive to sexual reality. So I don't know if you've noticed that there may be times in two, three, four, five days, everything is fine. Then one day you go, walk out of your house and it's like, what in the world is going on? You notice everything. It's like, oh my God, what's happening? I just need to put blindfolders on and say the blood of Jesus and go to work like that. Why? Because your body is more sensitive sexually. This doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you need to be more guarded during those times because people are crazy. Oh, I've noticed out there, man, people do not respect wedding rings if you're married. They don't respect that you're trying to live for God. Girls are becoming incredibly aggressive these days. They will come at you. They will come on to you. And we need to be guarded. And, you've got, and you have to realize these things happen at the most, uh, most inopportune times. I remember I was dealing with a guy, counseling him. He and his wife, they were going through a lot of trouble. And, um, man, he called me one day and he said, Bishop, no, no, actually, he didn't call me. He told me this later. He said, my wife and I had an argument, and the one thing she should never say to me, she said it. Whatever it was, he didn't tell me what it was. He said, it devastated me. He said, I went to work devastated. And when I went to work, he said, I got a call from an old girlfriend who said, I just looked you up, and I just found your number. He said, I've been missing you so much. She said, is there any way we can get together this evening? And he was so devastated in his marriage, he said he thought about it. But he said, no, 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 no. And he hung up. Three hours later, another old girlfriend called him. Looked him up. And he said, ah, I've been thinking about you. Is there any way we can get together? The devil is shrewd. We have to be careful. I've got a young man who I work with in ministry. He does my IT. He's one of my spiritual sons. And we were talking. He was having a little trouble in his marriage. His wife was going through some things. And he said, and 
He said, and daddy, Bishop, he said, I, I need my wife now more than ever. He said, because people are coming at me. I said, what do you mean? He said, I do IT. And this lady, I was helping her with her computer. He said, we've not had much conversation or whatever. And while I was working on my computer and she was standing here bending over me, she looked down and pointed at my middle. And she said, if you ever need me to put this in my mouth, let me know. You never know how the enemy will come against you. And we need to be guarded against. Is it okay if we talk real at a men's conference? You, you, did, you, didn't, you didn't invite me to come and play, did you? So the, the way the enemy tries to set things up is the relationships that you have that are supposed to be your emotional support, tension, conflict will be in those relationships. And then you're open, and when you're open is when the enemy comes and tries to bring something to you to conquer you. And my goal in this message is, again, for us to be resilient and fortified against this, but also to understand sexual sin in a way that perhaps we've not been thinking about it before. So understand that there are times you need to be more guarded than not. So if you're in a time when you're really struggling, get off social media. You may not even want to watch the Weather Channel. Because all them ladies have on tight dresses when they show you the weather. <laughs> Do whatever it takes. <laughs> you listen. To it. No, I'm serious. I am so very serious. You have to learn yourself and know how to guard yourself. You know, you might not be the one to hug sisters after church. No, you might be the one to just... <laughs> if you can't handle it. Don't go there. I'm serious. You do whatever it takes to keep yourself and know yourself because this is something God is not playing with. Now, marriage alone does not cure sexual issues. Marriage doesn't cure sex. You got to get that under control. I remember I was counseling somebody as a lady. She was crying her eyes out. She could not believe that her husband went and had an affair. And she was talking to me and she said, Bishop, she said, we do it almost every day. She said, we've had the best time sexually in our marriage. She said, forgive me again, this is men. If ladies were in here, I wouldn't talk like this. She said, we, we climax at the same time. Everything is the most wonderful encounters we've ever had. And then he's going to go out and be with somebody else. What can we do? I counseled another couple sitting down in front of me. And again, they were saying, she's, the wife looked at me. She said, she said uh, Pastor, we do it every day. And I thought she's, you know, just, and then she looked at me. She said, no, every day. We do something every day, but yet the guy still went outside the marriage. And one of the reasons why is because lust is insatiable. Listen to me. Lust does not want fulfillment. It has one mission, lust. That's why you can't let it in your spirit. Some people think lust wants the object of what it's lusting after, but that's not the mission of lust. The mission of lust is to lust. A spirit of pride, what does it do? It's proud. A spirit of anger, what does it do? Anger. A spirit of lust, what does it do? No fulfillment in it. Only more desire. Only more. It's like one of the financial movies, uh, I forget what it was, but one of those movies about the stock market in the 2008 crash, and uh, it was about greed. It was talking about American greed and so forth. And one of the people that was being interviewed there who had just made billions and billions of dollars in the stock market and was cheating people and overcoming, and somebody said, hey, sir, here's my question. How much is enough? And he answered, more. That was his only answer. And lust is so deceptive. Let's say a man is married a man is married and he's walking with his wife and another lady walks by and he starts lusting after her. Okay, you get it? If he was married to the lady he's now lusting after and his wife walks by, he will be lusting after the wife. Do you understand me? What's he, uh, are you hearing me? So, so it, we have to keep lust because it, it has no... It just wants to lust, and it's never satisfied. 
So you think, ah, if I can just have this one, hey, this one, ooh. the way she talks, the way she moves, the way her body, ah, if I can just get this one, ah, nah. If you don't deal with lust, that one, you, you remember the story in the Bible where one of David's sons, I think it was Amnon who wanted Tamar. You remember the story how he desired Tamar so bad he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, he was sick. He just wanted Tamar so bad. And then he finally had Tamar. And then the Bible said the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he... That's some demonic crap, man. We can't let that in our spirit. So it's not lust that we want. We have to keep it away from us by all means. And don't just think, ah... Man, I have a problem. I need to get married. Yes, you may need to get married. But don't just think that when you get married, everything disappears. It doesn't. You have to deal with the issue that's in your heart. Genesis 2, verse 24, man shall leave his own father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, every man should have his own wife. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says it's better to marry than to burn. So marriage is good. We need marriage. But marriage does not just cure lust. We have to get lust under control before we get married. Number two, we must take personal responsibility for our sin and not blame others. When David sinned, he said, against you and you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. We have to take personal responsibility for our own sin. My dad was a trip, and there's some stuff he handed me before he left that I didn't realize. He, he, he had pain, and I, I don't like to dishonor him, but I'm just trying to help you. Uh, my dad helped me with a number of things. He taught me how to speak well. He motivated my life, but he had a lot of hurt, pain, brokenness. He actually died, a uh, very young man from sin. But he was not a good role model, he was not faithful, and he just had uh, so many things going on. And there were some things that were passed down to me from him that as a young boy, I just began to, uh, to you know, he would leave things all around the house and it were just things I, saw, I grew up in that in Christ I had to overcome. But here's the deal, in Christ you can overcome them. Say amen. In Christ you can overcome them. So. The way many people stay in bondage is when you start blaming others for your situation instead of taking personal responsibility. I could blame my dad all day long. Did my father this and my dad that and my dad this and my dad that. That's not my dad. My dad's gone. I have to take res personal responsibility for whatever my issues were and whatever my issues are. And once you begin to take personal responsibility and stop blaming other people, then life will become better for you. Give me an amen. All right, what are the consequences of sexual immorality and impurity? What are the consequences? As with all sin, there are consequences to living in unbridled sexual immorality. Read, read, ready, read. Mm -hmm. Many men discount the consequences saying things like, boys will be boys. Consequences of sexual immorality can range from subtle all the way up to severe in King David's case. We must get a handle on this. Let's examine a few consequences. So, our society paints sexual immorality in the movies and everything like it's wonderful, it's glorious, but let's look at what the Bible says. Number one, leanness of soul. Psalm 106, 14 and 15. Let's read it together, ready? Read. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert and gave them their requests, but sent leanness of soul unto them. Wow. We can't do that without it affecting our soul and our soul getting lean in some way. Proverbs 6, 32. Ready? Let's read. Whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that does it destroys his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Wow. Somebody say wow backwards. That's some deep stuff right there. Can we read that again? Let's read it again. Whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that does it destroys his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Jesus. Let's read it a third time. <laughs> Whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that does it destroys his own soul. 
Wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Can I mention something to you? An unguarded strength is a double weakness. People who think this can never happen to them are more in danger of it happening to them than not. That's, that's why one of the things I do is I pray constantly. I was praying it this morning again, praying it last night, praying it this morning. Because I pray constantly. I told you again, a sign of spiritual maturity is dependence, not independence. It, the more dependent you are on God. So one of the things I just constantly pray, I'm like, Lord, uh, every day of my life, keep me. Every day that I live in the future, keep me. If temptation will come to the left, lead me to the right. If it's on the right, lead me to the left. If it's all around, make me stay home and fast and pray. Lord, never let, I, I constantly ask God to give me grace not to uh, yield even in weak moments. Because one of the things I realize, again, many strong men have been slain by her. Many strong men have been slain by her. So you can't assume that you're going to be able to live above this. I remember a young man who came to talk to me once and he had fallen into sin. And he said, man, I just uh, went to this girl's house to pick up something and actually to drop off something. And when I went there, the front door was cracked open and I started to leave it on the porch, but I said, no, somebody will steal it. So I knocked on the door and she from the back said, oh, come in. So he said, I walked in and then she walked out from the back with no clothes on. And he said to me, he said, Bishop, I just got weak. He said, I just lost all inhibition. So the kind of prayer I pray is God, if that's going to happen, then I will go to the wrong house. <laughs> You're not listening to me. No, 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 no. You say, oh, you must, you must struggle all the time. No, 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 no. By the grace of God. By the grace of God, he's helped me. No, I don't struggle all the time. I don't want you to get the wrong picture. I just don't trust myself. Because when I look at some of the men who have fallen, some people, Men I know, popular men in the body of Christ that I know a lot of things about. And guys who I know love God. And I look at King David in the Bible. And how in an unguarded moment, you know, you, you're looking over your balcony and you see somebody who's taking a bath. And then you ask, what is her name? And they say her name is Bath. Sheba. <laughs> I, and, and how in a moment of being unguarded, I, I look at all of that. I look at Samson, who was so emotionally needy that he knows the woman is trying to get him killed, yet he still lays his head on her lap. Ah! And he has enough power to take gates and move them up a mountain, but he's so emotionally needy that he will lie. Ah, and when I look at that in the Bible... No, I don't, no, 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 I don't play. I just, no, God, you have to keep me, oh, you know, <laughs> you, you, no, you, no, 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 no. Because I realize that this thing can bring leanness of soul. All right? Number two, it's a sin against the body. First Corinthians 6, 15 through 19. Let's read it together. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Know ye not that he that is joined to a harlot is one body, for two says he shall be one. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which, is, which you have of God is not your own. This one is so powerful here. So <clears throat> back in the old day, do you know how they used to get married back in the old day? They didn't do the stuff like we do, you know, spend 15000 Did I say $15,000, $25,000 on a wedding and flop? What's that? Oh, oh, up. Oh, $50,000? The devil is alive. Jeez. <laughs> Me and my wife got married for about $500, man. I just believed in doing it right. And, and it, it, it lasted 33 years. Pray the Lord. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting distracted here. Uh, what was I saying? I was saying something good. Yes, the way they got married in the Old Testament is not the way we do it now, where you plan up to this perfect day, spend $50,000, get everything right. That's not the way they would do it. The guy would go to the parents' house about a year before, maybe six months or a year before, and said, I want to court your daughter. They would set dowry. He would pay the dowry. And some night that she's not aware of, some night that she does not know, 
then the guy will get all of his friends, everybody would trim their lamps, and they would start walking through the town at night, and there would be a cry that said, the bridegroom is coming. And that girl had to be ready that night. She never knew what night it was. That was a symbol of Jesus coming, but that's the way they would do it. And the wedding ceremony is where he would go to her house somewhere at 10, 11 o'clock at night, unexpected, take her into his tent with only them there and get married. So what was the ceremony? The ceremony was the culminating, the cult, cultivating of the marriage through the sexual act. Now, I don't have time to go deep into this, but the entire sexual act God made to be ratification of a covenant in the way he made it. So when you marry a virgin that night, the covenant of marriage is ratified. So that act was the marriage that sealed the actual marriage. So here's what the Bible's saying, saying that you don't understand that when you join yourself to a harlot, you become one with the harlot. Let me make it plain to you. Plain to you. you don't even know her name. You just had a, 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 a 10 minute rendezvous. You left $20 on the dresser, or I don't even know what that stuff costs, whatever, on the dresser, and you walked out without even knowing her name, God said, you're one. That's how powerful the sexual encounter is. And many times before we get married, there are many men who have had multiple sexual partners. And uh, we, we have to begin to understand and reclaim the holiness of sexual encounters and make sure that we don't play with them at all. Because when you do it, it's a sin against the body. Number three, it brings you into slavery. Jesus said, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Romans 6, 16, let's read it together. Uh-huh. Whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Number four, uh, and a dangerous one is it could lead to loss of faith. It can lead to loss of faith. And that's very, very dangerous. First Corinthians chapter six talks about know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortionists shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of the living God. Uh, the danger of sexual temptation is it could bring you to a place where you lose your faith and suffer eternal damnation. I don't have a lot of time to unpack that. So let's just talk about for a few minutes about how to get victory. How do we get victory from this? Freedom from sexual immorality will be the result of God helping you and making the decision a thousand times a day not to go toward the things that will cause you to be sexually immoral. The issue is not about God delivering us from something as much as it is making a choice to live the way God called us to live. Here's a testimony I have written here from a man named Steve Hill, who was part of the Brownsville Revival. I want to read that to you. He says, I was an alcoholic to the max. Every day I would drink whiskey, straight, and I was a junkie. Cocaine was up my nose and in my arm. I did it all, friend, and God never delivered me from the desire and the love of drugs. He never did. What happened is that I decided to never touch the stuff or drink booze again. Those of you who are into pornography may be asking God to take away your lustful desire. You're a man with hormones. You feel things. You have, a, you have ever since you were a teenager, and you will until the day you die. You're attracted to the opposite sex. I'm not saying that God cannot take the desire from you. He can he has just never done it in my life or in terms of a thousand other people I've worked with over the years. That includes pornographers. 99 of them had to make decisions. They had to make a decision to not walk by a magazine rack, an adult magazine, and stay faithful to their wives and their family. It is time to make a decision. So I've been saying that to you throughout this time in ways. There are certain things you're going to notice. You're going to notice beauty. You're going to be moved by things. You're going to be turned on by things. We have to make a decision over and over again to live in sexual purity. So how do we do it? Number one, we remove the weights and offenses. Let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 together. Ready? Read. Wherefore, see, and go ahead. Cloud of witnesses, go ahead.
So the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. What's the language that it uses? Lay aside. So how do you lay something aside? Say what? Get rid of it. Lay it aside. Stop doing it. I think sometimes the key is we try to get free without pain. Or we try to get free without any kind of emotional discomfort. And that just doesn't work. That just doesn't work. So the Bible said, lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets us. It's basically a decision not to do it anymore. Again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Not literally. Uh, if, your, if your right hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and that your whole body should not be cast into hell. So again, Jesus is talking about aggressive approaches to cleanness, whatever it takes. And by the way, if anybody does have an issue with, let's just say, pornography, you have to get aggressive about that. They have apps now that you can download on your phone, download on your computer, and you choose an accountability partner. And every time you visit a certain thing, it will send a notification to somebody who's an accountability person. If you have a struggle with that, get it and download it. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get the names to some of those, but if you just Google it, there's several different apps that are like that there. Have somebody in your life you're able to talk to plainly about things that, that are going on in your life and struggles that you have that you can open up to and tell anything that's happening. Um, be careful how you speak to your spouses, for those who are married, about certain things. Use wisdom there. Get counsel from your pastor. But use aggressive approaches because here's the way the enemy works. Things that are in the dark he's able to work on. When things come to the light, they're exposed, the enemy's not able to work on them anymore. And there are too many people who have been destroyed through this aspect of sexual sin. And by the grace of God, the men of agape will walk in victory in Jesus' name. That clap was too small for me. I said, we'll walk in victory in Jesus' name. The second thing we have to do is deny ourself. Deny ourself. Colossians 3, 5 through 6, let's read it together. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Man, y'all just speaking in tongues. Come on. Let's start it over. Ready? Read. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetous, which is idolatry, which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. So that word inordinate affection, uh, one time I was teaching this and that word stood out to me because some of the single brothers oftentimes ask a question like, how, how close can you go without sinning? So what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? You know, is it okay to hold hands? Can you kiss with just the lips? Mm -hmm. Or can you rub your tongues together? Or can you put your hand on different places? Do you just keep your hand on the shoulder? Or can your hands go on the waist? Or can you move your hands down a little bit to the padded part? Uh, okay, you guys are not, there's no single men that are in here. <laughs> uh, do you, you know, just how close can you go? Can you, I'm serious, these are questions people have. Is it, is oral okay as long as you don't go all the way? Is it sin and all that? And my counsel in that is this. If you're not married, then that's your sister. So whatever it's legal to do with your sister, enjoy. <laughs> yeah, he said it depends on where you're from. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. Yeah, I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> I won't touch that one. Um, we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. So the Holy Spirit li living on the inside of us should really give us guidance and counsel. You know, weddings are interesting. You know, in the wedding, before the wedding is over, they say, you may now kiss. And you know why they say that? Because they expect that that's the first kiss. Hey! <laughs> 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 
It, I, I, I don't, again, this is not a message to try to put you in bondage. It's to cause our hearts to stay pure before God, to cause us to be able to walk in the authority that God has given us so we can be all that God has called us to be. Number three, we have to renew our mind. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. We continue to renew our mind through the word of God. We wash ourselves with the word of God. We get ourselves to the place with the word of God where the areas that we're having trouble, we're not doing it anymore. Number four, we look for the escape routes. Oh, God, we look for the escape routes. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, let's read it together. They have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Is this being streamed? It's not being streamed, right? It's not being streamed right now, but it's recorded. Oh, you, but it's recorded, but you will not stream it. Okay. Don't stream it, because I'm about to talk about something. <laughs> Unless your pastor says, you know, then you can cut this out. I was in Ghana. And I was doing a crusade, and there was this person who was very close to my wife, actually. Helped my wife out, served my wife in ministry, and um, I, there was nothing. I mean, for years, she's around my wife, and there's nothing, nothing inappropriate, nothing. And I get to Ghana, and uh, the anointing was something, and miracles, and something, and I don't know what happened to this girl. But all of a sudden, she started acting funny toward me, seriously funny, just eyes and attention on this trip. Now, the trip is a lot of people. It's a lot of us. My wife is there. She's there, and a lot of different people are there, and she's acting funny toward me, and I can't figure out why, and in my mind, I'm confused, and I can't understand what's happening. So that particular trip, my wife had to go back to America early, and some of the team stayed behind, and some of the team went. And we had three different phones that we shared among people on the trip. Different, different people would use the phones to call back to the USA and whatever. And this kid started acting so funny toward me, just so weird. So I didn't think much of it. So my wife was gone, and I stay in a one-bedroom apartment in the guest house that I built in Ghana. So I had, I had the phone that night. And... About 10 o'clock before I went to sleep, my son from another part of Ghana came and I said, uh, I, he said, uh, I'm going to, so I said, no, 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 don't go, just come here and sleep on the couch. So he slept on the couch in the living room, I was in the bedroom. So about three o'clock in the morning, somebody banged on the door and I, it startled me and woke me up and I went to the door and it was this girl and the way she was dressed. She said, I, I came to get the phone, but she came for more than the phone. You could see it all over her. And I, I, I just, I felt disgusted in the minute, not just because she's very close to my wife, whatever, and I got the phone, and I, I just, you know, just sent her to the room, and I couldn't believe it. But I realized that at 10 o'clock that night, my son just showed up from nowhere and just decided, we just decided he would sleep on the couch. I love God. I love my wife. You like to think that even if my son wasn't there, I still would have been disgusted. But who knows? But God made a way of escape. That's what I'm trying to show you. Right? Uh, yeah. This, I didn't like this girl. I wasn't lusting after this girl. I don't want you to get, get it wrong, but I believe it was a divine setup. I believe it was a trap, but God gave me a way of escape. Now, could I have said, listen, go to your room, come back in 10 minutes, and then I wake my son up. I say, hey, son, I need you to go and find me some NyQuil. He said, daddy, it's, no, 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 just, just go, 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 go. And then I said, come back in 10 minutes. Could I have done that? Yes, I could have done that. But God gives you, gives you a way of escape. You know what you do? You take the way of escape. That's what the Bible says. There's no temptation taken to you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will make a way of escape 
in the time of temptation. When God gives you a way of escape, you take the way of escape. Let's thank God for all the times he's given us escape. Amen. All right, we're almost finished. The fifth thing we do is guard the eye gate. Guard the eye gate. Guard the eye gate. Uh, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes to not think lustfully upon a girl. This is a serious one. I'm not going to read all of that. It's a very serious one. There's a verse that talks about eyes full of adultery. We get in trouble with the eyes before we get in trouble with the heart. And we really as men need to learn how to control the eyes. Uh, you know, you see something, you know that that's going to be an issue over there. You just, you just don't put your eyes on it. That's why, again, be careful with social media. Be careful with television. Be careful with movies. Know, know your limits. Know when you can do things. Know when you can't do things. That's part of keeping yourself. When I talk to men, I like to be real. I like to try to open up and give you things that, uh, you know, because you ever read a biography of somebody and in the biography it's like, oh, he's so great. He doesn't, you just think he walks on water every day. I try to open up and just give you real examples of reality. So here's the real deal. I talked to you last night about spiritual authority and about the spirit of Jezebel. Many people think Jezebel is about immorality, but she's really not. She's about control, and she'll use sex as a control mechanism. And one of the strongest ways men abandon their authority is by being bound in some way to the opposite sex. But in agape, we men will rise above that. Single men will live holy and pure until God gives you your wife. Married men will live with one wife and be satisfied all of their days. And by the way, with intersexual union, be careful what you allow in your bedroom. The Bible said the marriage bed is undefiled, but be careful what you allow in your bedroom. Because you could stir up lust even in your marriage situation, and it could begin to, if you're not careful, open a door to you wanting more. Uh, so without putting you in bondage, I just want to say you just want to be careful for those who are married. Raise the hand of all the men who are married. Okay. So there's sometimes people think that when you're married, you have to watch something to get excited and you have to have toys and things. And, oh, and I just want to advise you to be careful for that because marriage is about fulfilling covenant. It's not just about lust. And if you bring lust into your marriage relationship, then lust only wants to lust. You understand? Lust only wants to lust. So it can cause you to be more unfulfilled even in your relationship. It's an expression of, of, of covenant love. And the way God designed it is eye to eye, knee to knee, breath to breath, face to face. That's the way he designed it. I'm not saying that other situations are not allowed, but I'm saying Make sure it's a covenant right of fulfillment of a beautiful thing God gave and not just a, a lust fest where you just try to outdo uh, lust every other time because that can open the door for you to begin to have desires in other areas. Man, it is so quiet up in here. I don't know what's up. So as resilient men, we have to conquer the thing that tried to conquer Joseph. We have to overcome the thing that brought calamity in David's life. We have to conquer the thing that messed with Samson. We have to conquer the thing that the Bible says many strong men have been slain by her. We have to conquer the thing that until you, listen, even, even those men who are a bit older, men who are 60 and 70 and up, I'm talking to you as well. In Africa, there's this guy that went to a man who was 89 years old and he said, Baba, he said, I wanted to know, how old does a man have to be before he loses his mojo? And Baba looked down, and he looked up, he said, you're going to have to ask somebody older than me. <laughs> if you're a man, also take care of your health. Um, uh, the enemy is attacking a lot of marriages now by people allowing themselves to get unhealthy. And then when you allow yourself to be unhealthy, you're not as strong in that area as you used to be. Uh, things like diabetes and high blood pressure, they, because everything about the sexual act is blood flow. You, and the smallest uh, blood vessels in the body are in the male organs, smallest ones. So if you begin to get a hindrance in blood flow, high cholesterol and all those things, it begins to affect that area. And there are a number of people, high blood pressure, diabetes, and all those things, and medications, and they begin to affect the ability to perform there. So take care of your health so that you're able to take care of your wife. 
All right, y'all have had enough. All right, hey, I'm just going to leave it there. I don't know. I, I don't know what you... Are we doing... So... Do, yes, go. No, no, pray. Can we, um, I think this is time just... I can probably take two to three questions. Oh, is great, that what great. you were asking? No, that would be great. That would be great. Just two to three, I think. Yes. Uh, are we good enough on time? Two to three. If I'm there by 12, I think I'm good. So, cool. Okay. So, let's... Um, takers. Like, okay, so, Brother Jeff. Let me pass the Mac over. Okay. Um, actually, this question hit me the, the moment that we read this um, Bible verse, which is the second one. It says... Um, you are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from meat, of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Well, anyway, you, you know the verse. So I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, for those of us that grew up in Lagos, we are, we are familiar with this. Um, during the Islamic uh, holidays, you know, they slaughtered goats and cows and all that, and, uh, and they shared the meat and to all the neighbors around. Okay, and trust me, if you did grow up, you would know that that meat is delicious. It'd be slapping, you know. So, I've always heard that this meat is um, it's a sacrificial meat, and it's not sacrificed to our God. So, I don't know, what do you know? How much do you know about yeah. this? I, I know about that practice. I understand what you're saying. So, the biblical guideline, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is where you would want to read. Paul gives guidelines on that. Paul said, if somebody puts meat before you, eat it asking no questions. That's what the word says. Eat it asking no questions. But if they told you this meat was given in sacrifice to a God, then don't eat it, mostly for conscience sake. So if they put some good goat before you <laughs> with some shito, mm, eat it asking no questions, but bless it. But if they say this was sacrificed to Shumadu or whatever, then say, I'm sorry, that one I can't eat. It's that simple. Okay. Right. We got another question in the back over there. Okay. Josie, right? And it's the final question, by the way. Oh, there's, we can do one more, I think. Just one more. Good morning, Bishop. Yes, sir. Um, my question, um, well, I have two questions, if I may layer. Yes, sir. Uh, so yesterday you talked about... Um, Staying away from things like music that, that may be impure and things like that, right? So um, I want to follow that up with movies. This is something that um, both my wife and I, we enjoy, right? Movies, how can, do you believe that movies can also influence the way we move in and, um, yeah. you know, our resilience in, in a sense, right? Yeah. And then the, the second question is greed versus ambition. Say that. The, greed versus ambition. Greed versus ambition. You know, um... When do we get to a point of greed, and how do we maintain, first off, in, in, in authority, which is, I, I would attribute that to ambition, yeah. and um, when does that become also sinful? Okay. Uh, answer to your first question, movies can have, I mean, we, we know that. Uh, the enemy can attack movies. There can be actresses in movies that have evil um, evil spirits on them. So yeah, there are certain movies that can definitely impact you. There's some movie out right now, I refuse to watch it, I think it's called The Deliverance. And there are a lot of people I hear talking about it that it is so demonic. The people that were filming it were dying and all of that, and I won't go near it, I won't touch it. So there are movies that can definitely affect you and you have to be very careful. There's this thing that I use, my wife and I, she's into movies, I'm not into them that much, called Vid Angel. V-I-D-A-N-G-L-E-L -L or L-E. Uh, E-L, I think. And in that, you can block out uh, all profanity. You can block out all sex acts. You can block out anything that you don't want to see. Blasphemy. They have it where you can filter out all of those things and you can watch a movie without seeing any of those things. And then because it's a Christian company, most of the movies on there will be good anyway. So I recommend that to those that want to watch movies. In terms of greed versus ambition, it's an issue of motive. Uh, ambition is something God encourages us to have. But greed, you get to the point of greed where, um, just like lust, it's insatiable. It becomes this real insatiable desire to just desire more. What I would do if I were you is I wouldn't worry about crossing the line. 
I would just press on with the desires of your heart and ask God to show you if any of your motives are unclean. But don't shrink back with your ambition thinking it might be greed. Just go for it. Okay? Yes, sir. Take one more. I saw his answer for us, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, is two, but let me just quickly ask um, the two questions. So, how do you define sexual sins in marriage, with the exception of adultery, right? How do you know what is clean and what is unclean? Probably a, examples that we need to know that, okay, now we're crossing the line and now we're not. And the second part of it is, why it says the most common sin that men has to deal with. Is that a permanent solution? Why is what? Sex. I uh, mean, sexual yeah. immorality, the most okay. common sin. Yeah. I think if that sin alone is taken out of man's life, <laughs> is that a permanent solution? That's deep. <laughs> you have some serious men in this church, or. Oh. I have to stay where the Bible stays on marriage. And the Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled. So I can't go beyond what the Bible does. I will give some guidelines in natural terms. Uh, the one thing that I could speak with some great degree of confidence is we should follow the rules of nature. There's certain things that God made with certain purpose. Certain areas of the body are not entrances, they're exits. See me? You with me? Okay. And if God made it to be an exit, then don't turn it into an entrance. Okay. So I think a safe guideline to go by is looking. <laughs> God, you guys. No. <laughs> a safe guideline to go by is going by the natural use of things. But I can't spe specify things where God doesn't specify. So you got the natural use of everything and how things are supposed to be taken care of naturally. Now, um, the Bible does give room for creativity in marriage. In fact, a study was done that said only 20% of women will get to the mountaintop, have an orgasm just through normal intercourse alone. So sometimes your wife, in order for you to really fulfill her, uh, you know, there, there are some other ways that you might have to make sure that, you know, that's taken care of. So all of that stuff to me in the marriage bed is allowed. But you have to be careful not to turn it into a lust fest. That's my point. It should be a heart-to-heart -heart covenant release and covenant response. So I can't give you more examples than the natural laws that God created as a guide and the Holy Spirit giving you insight. And of course, respecting each other. If there's certain things that somebody's uncomfortable with, that's the guidelines I'll give you in marriage. And men are sexual beings. We're visually oriented. We get stimulated by what we see. And we have a literal physical reaction in our body whenever our scrotum is full of seed. And it, that's just the way it is. And that's why the enemy attacks men so much in that area. And yes, we can overcome it. But we, but we have to be aware of it, aware of how serious it is. And that's why I wanted to teach on it. So um, until the day we die, it's something we'll have to deal with. Uh, Abraham's wife died when he was 120. He got married again. So, you know. We, <laughs> we, it's just something we're just going to have to continue to deal with. So, yeah. I wish we had more time. Uh, you guys have been let's amazing. Give it a I love you. To the bishop. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, please, please, let's honor the man. Let's, we could do better than that. Yeah. Let's give it a round of applause. Bless you. Thank Bless you so you, much, sirs. Bishop. Thank you so much. Bless so, you. at this point, we're just going to take a quick group picture. This is memorable. Let's take a picture of this right now before the bishop leaves. And he has some books outside. Please make sure we don't want to leave any book. Those books were shipped over here. Let's like you know, honor the man. Just buy the books. The the awesome books to like you know um, just put it in your you know library and just make sure you read them. So at this point, let's take pictures. How do Jose, we take uh, How do we walk this? So okay, okay. So okay, okay. So we'll stay. Okay. All right. So it's gonna so be this way. Okay. Uh, Bishop, you're gonna be right here. I mean, okay. Pastor. Then we'll just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Set it. Yeah. Set it. Set it. Mm. All right. Cool. Let's do this.
capture him. Yeah. Let's stretch out a little bit. Come forward. Let's stretch out a little bit. So you can come towards here so we can capture everybody. Thank you. I just have to move this one, sure. Okay. So do we... Can everybody see? <laughs> Do we get down? No, okay. 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 All right. Bless you, sir.